So Paul, we, we, the sun, the planets, the earth, they all form in the same protoplanetary disk. Now I guess the big question is how do we know when or how long ago did that happen? Well, it's very hard to date the sun. Um, I guess we can't go digging in it, right? I mean, our stellar models tell us it's a few billion years, but they wouldn't give a very precise age. So I guess a few could be three, it could be five. It and could be seven, probably. That's a pretty big difference, right? Yeah, so, yeah. How long was it? Well, it's somewhere between plus or minus a few billion years. <laughs> that's quite a big error bar. Yeah, that's right. Um, however, what we can date are other things that formed the same time, in particular rocks and, in particular, particular um, meteorites. Okay. Now, the meteorites probably formed about the same time as the Earth and the Mars and the Moon and everything like that, but most of the original rocks on the Earth's surface have long since been buried, mm. eroded, and so on. Whereas a lot of meteorites, they solidified pretty, pretty rapidly after the protoplanetary disk formed, and they probably haven't changed very much since then. So we, so we can't dig into the Earth because there's been so much change, but these things have been, we think, relatively unchanged since the beginning of the solar system. That's right. So. Can we date the meteorite we've got up at Mount Stromlo? It's a, uh, essentially a fancy doorstop with how much it weighs. <laughs> yes, and uh, the way we do this okay. is using radioactive isotopes. Okay. And there are numerous techniques we can use. I'm going to talk about probably the most accurate, which is called lead-lead dating for measuring these ages. Okay. And the basic idea is that the solar system formed out of a giant molecular cloud and the stark molecular cloud will have contained, that's mostly hydrogen and helium, but it would have contained some lead that had come out of previous stars over the last few billion years. So it's a small amount, but it's there. Yes. And that amount of lead would have gone into the protoplanetary disk when this collapsed, and it would have been incorporated into rocks. So it essentially would have been mixed around and formed into rocks and even the sun, as we've seen previously, looking yes. at stars. So the sun would contain lead, um, and as would um, rocks and the earth and the moon and everything. Yep. Now, lead is not radioactive, so it's going to remain. However, there would also be some radioactive elements. Mm -hmm. Now, they can't have been in the giant molecular cloud for too long because they would have decayed into something else. But presumably some point when the giant molecular cloud was forming, you had probably a supernova explosion. Yep. Um, and that dumped some radioactive elements into this cloud. Okay. If the cloud had then sat around for the next few billion years, they would all have decayed away. But it was a fairly short period of time between when the supernova dumped it in there and then that turned into planets and froze yep. everything. So and we know this is the case because there are some, uh, we can see some decays of things like aluminium 26, which are highly sh short radioactive half-lives, and the fact that we see the decay from them in the solar system indicates the solar system, this cloud must have been irradiated by a supernova pretty soon before it collapsed. Yep. Now the particular element we're going to use is uranium. Okay. So radioactive uranium would have been dumped into this cloud, and uranium, well, so lead we're going to have, there are basically three isotopes of lead we are concerned about, lead 204, lead 206, and lead 207. Okay. Now, so these are different isotopes of the same thing, so these have different amounts of neutrons going inside. So they have the same number of electrons, which means they behave chemically the same. Yep. They have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. Okay. So if you weigh them, they're different, but all other purposes, they just behave like lead. Okay. And all of these are seen in lead, in, if you look at lead today, it's going to be a mix of all these things. Okay. Uh, lead 206 is the most common, lead 207 not much less, and lead 204 red to be rare, but it's still there in any bit of lead on your roof or... Um, we'll have a small amount of 204. Yes. Okay. Now it just so happens that uranium, which has been dumped out of the supernova, is radioactive, and there are two main isotopes of uranium we need to worry about, uranium 238 and 235. Okay. Now these are enormously... Um, important because they use the building atomic bombs That's today. Right. Yes, people talk about enriching uranium-238 all the time. Yes, so uranium-238 is not very useful for building atomic bombs. Uranium-235 is, yep. and normally this is like 1% of the uranium you dig up in, say, outback Australia. Yes. And so large numbers of nasty people around the world are trying to concentrate that to build atomic bombs and not worry so much about this one. But this is the common one we find here on yeah. Earth. And this has a half-life, and these are very well known because it's useful for killing people, and therefore governments spend lots of money on <laughs> so research. So one of the more them. accurate measurements we've ever had. Yes, and this is a half-life of 4.468 billion years, giga years. Okay, so 4,468,000,000 giga years. So we know that to within a million years, which is 
pretty good given it's almost five decimal In fact, we know more decimal places than yeah. that. I just didn't bother putting them on the slide. <laughs> okay. So this lasts a very long time, yep. which is probably why there's so much of it still around today. That it's, um, on the other hand, uranium-235 only lasts 704 million years. So this is much, much, much shorter than this, which yes. means this will decay quicker than this one. But these are still both very long half-lives. Yeah, that's true. So they could expect to have some of these still left on Earth today. Which we do. Most of this will have gone away. Maybe sort of half of this or so would have gone away. Uh, but there's still going to be some of both, where okay. something like carbon-12 with a half-life of only a few thousand years would have entirely gone away if it had been dumped in by a supernova. Okay. So, complicated argument here. Now, Uranium-238 decays, and it decays via a long chain. It turns into one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing, and eventually it'll keep on going until it ends up with something that is stable. The first stable thing it reaches is lead-206. So essentially it's kind of shedding these neutrons through reactions until it gets to 206, which ends up turning into essentially lead. Yeah, so some of the neutrons will turn into protons and electrons and alpha particles will be spat out. And by a long chain of reactions, it'll eventually end up as lead-206. Somewhere along this chain of reactions is actually things like radium. That's where radium comes okay. from. Because right. radium is actually highly radioactive. If there was any in the solar system to begin with, it would have long since gone away. Yep. The radium that Marie Curie discovered must have come through uranium which has longer lived, decaying through this chain, one of which is radium. So these are the similar processes that we talked about in the star section when we were talking about measuring the contents and the age of the sun, but in a different way measuring out here in other parts of the solar system. That's right. Likewise, uranium-235 also decays via a chain of reactions, um, which end up as lead-207. Okay, so these end up at different things. Yes, Okay. and that's... Crucial point. Yes. I was going to say, because if this ended up as that and that ended up as that, it'd be... Or oh, sometimes it ended up as this or sometimes it would be confusing. Yep. yep. So basically, um, what's going to happen is as time goes on, the amount of lead-207 will increase as the uranium-235 yep. goes away. That's right. And that will occur on a time scale of 700 million years, so quite, oh. quite quickly. Yes. <laughs> Speaking to an astronomer. <laughs> 700 million years is only quick to us. And likewise, the amount of uranium-206 will increase, but it will increase more slowly because this takes longer to decay. On the other hand, there's more uranium-238, so in the long run, this will probably increase by more. So you eventually end up with more because there's more initially to start with, but it's going to take a lot longer to get to that point compared to the 700 million years it does for 235. Yes, yeah, so in principle, you can measure how much of both of these there terms are. of lead there are, and you can compare it to lead 204, because lead 204 is telling you how much lead there was to begin with, because lead 204 mm. does not, is not produced by any radioactive elements. So this is your, so this is kind of our starting point. It's our control, it tells okay. us. All right. And so that doesn't change, Okay. And but these will both change, and that will change quickly, but not by so much, this will change slower, but by more. Yep. And so by looking at the relative amount of these things, we can kind of date how long ago a piece of rock formed. Okay. So essentially we're going to look at the ratios of these three over time. That's right. 